two, two of you raised a question about the sinning of the president and the judiciary. Please go through the Constitution or the laws of Ghana. There is nowhere where the president can refuse to receive a bill passed by parliament. In fact, the crafters of the Constitution are so careful that they even took away veto power from the president. So in Ghana, our president cannot veto a bill passed by parliament. It's clear in the Constitution that the president will receive the bill passed by parliament. If he has concerns, he will communicate to parliament that I have concerns on this bill that you have passed within seven days. Then he has 14 days to put across those concerns back to parliament. And parliament is called upon to reconsider the bill, taking his inputs into consideration. That is what is in the Constitution and the laws of Ghana. So if the president refuses to even receive the bill, what has he done to the Constitution? You understand? Two, in the Constitution, the president is permitted to refer the bill to the Council of State for advice. He didn't even do that. So the term I even used is very mild. <laughs> in the case of the judiciary, a bill is a bill. It's not law. It's just a bill. Uh, this is a draft that is being discussed. The judiciary is going to do what? Be part of the law making process. Tell us what to do in the bill. It's only when is passed and assented to by the president, then it becomes law that the judiciary can come in to interpret and enforce. There's nothing like that. And this is something that immediately, with supersonic speed, it should have been jettisoned, not entertained at all by the court. Now, what it means is that any time any bill is before us, and we are working on it at this stage, anybody can just take it to the court. And that will mean that parliament will have to stop and wait until the final determination of what? What are they to determine? Please. We are doing this for Ghana, and not for only today's generation. For generations yet, unborn. We are building a durable, sustainable governance structure that gives certainty to everybody that is the rule of law that prevails, not of man, or the rule by law. The two are not the same. When you rule by law, people are not certain of the law. And so even investors run away. And as a leader for so many years, from 2001, I've been a leader. I can mention so many serious investors who say they will not invest in Ghana because of uncertainty of the law. 
attempts to invest here, you will definitely have branches of the law, and then the courts and the system cannot tell you what the law is. And they lose a lot. So when you talk about unemployment, underdevelopment, and the rest, now who calls them? Leadership, I believe strongly, is cause. Everything else is effect. Even though followers matter. Followers matter. And that is where, in fact, we applauded the efforts of the president. When in his inaugural speech, he talked about us being citizens and not what? Spectators. Today, Ghanaians are now more spectators than citizens. I think you have to wake up and become the citizens that he called us to be. That is where I'm moving towards. I don't have any ill will or malice, no. I don't have any ambition. If there's honorable bagwin or whatever people don't want, please, that one, I can assure you, I'll go and relax. And my holy village is always there to welcome me. I don't have any problem at all. But once I sit here, I take the decisions and I'm responsible. Nobody else but me. That's why I started with my oath. I swore the oath. And at the end of the day, when I'm to account for my life to my creator, nobody is do that, to do that with me. I'll be alone. And I'll be there. Those of you who will come later. <laughs> because I believe in life after death. In fact, we have you told that place better than here. So I have no problem with dying. I'm always prepared any time to die. And, but you will come after that. And <laughs> you will come and meet me there. <laughs> <laughs> eh? I will tell you what seniority means. <laughs> <laughs> the right honorable speaker shall live to tell of the good works of recall, the Lord. Hey, there's, there's one on there. Oh, okay. The, 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 I have the indications recall. that there are some two critical questions. So yeah, maybe I'll after finish, that, yes, then we can quickly go away. Oh, recall. I recall, I can't say it's an abuse. Oh. The constitution permits them to do what they do. It's just that Please, don't only think about today. Also think about tomorrow when you are doing some of these things. And for me, as I sit here, I thought the focus of those in government shall be about government business, not even the position they occupy. Which is more important? It's government business. And for the position you occupy, if you work well, you may even get a higher position. Yes, sir. <laughs> eh? It's the good people of Ghana who will decide. So I'm surprised that some people are focused on that one. But tomorrow, you will hear from me. <laughs> we will take, we are bringing proceedings to a close, but I see Our that parliament is, oh. so far is transformatory. In fact, this is a parliament. I've been from the first to the eighth. The first was foundational. And the late Right Honorable Justice Daniel Annan had to use all his experience and wisdom to establish the parliament. And so he started by transforming the rules that we inherited from the 79 to 81 parliament, that's the Third Republic, and also putting the structures and personnel in place, creating the opportunity for 
further training, education, and the rest. He did that. The second parliament, led by Right Honorable, the late Right Honorable Peter Lajiti, focused on trying to strengthen uh, the second speaker, I should say. Second speaker, third parliament. To strengthen the institution of parliament. And you recall sometimes he had some rough edges with the president. No wonder he lasted for four years only. <laughs> and it established a four-year term for Speaker of Parliament. The fourth was trying to stabilize the fourth, uh, the third speaker. And that was Right Honorable Ebenezer Sechi Hughes. I worked with all of them. The fifth came, and that was our beautiful lady, Supreme Court Judge, Justice Edeline Bamford Ado. And she, with her experience from the bench, Focus on the rules and dignity of the house. So you could see her dressing, her posture, her patience, and everything mattered to the institution. Then the next speaker, that was my brother, very good friend of mine who was my chief whip, became my deputy leader when I was the leader. Later on became first deputy speaker and became speaker. So he used his experience in the house and his connection with members, particularly their dealings at the Parliamentary Service Board to initiate a lot of things. And then our professor came. Who in 1990 to take us on issue in the of Ghana, the political science department. So we studied together. I knew him long before he came. And I happened to be the second duty speaker to him. So I have all that record and all the happenings in the house. And I saw how we struggled to change the rules of the game. But before I became speaker, the voters changed the rules. And so you now don't have a majority where you can just sit down and just put the question. And you are sure the eyes have it. And so most attack, there is no day that I will go and preside without calling the leaders to my lobby for us to go through the agenda of the day, which is usually captured on what? The order paper, yellow. This is what is on the paper, cut from the business statement. How do we handle it? Then the leaders will tell me, those that they agree, those that they disagree, even when they disagree, how do we handle it? We discuss all that. Okay, how many from each side of the house? We discuss that. How many minutes per person? We discuss that. Then I just come to preside and enforce what we have discussed. That is why it's difficult for us to be sitting at 10. Because sometimes I have to get them to make sure that there's some peace before we go out there. This is what we do on a daily basis. I just don't come and preside and impose my ideas. Even when you go to voting, we agree. We will oppose. If you give eyes during the voice vote, we will challenge your decision. We will count hairs. We will do secret voting. We will not allow public voting. We discuss all this. And so even so, the discussion 
at that period, when people, leaders go on air and go and reveal those conclave confidential information, what is that meant to, be, to achieve? I should not invite them to discuss things with them again. And what will happen on the floor? In spite of all that, for four good years, four good years, people are still not appreciative. And I am the target. Hey, this is my God. Hey. <laughs> it's a living God, though. <laughs> so please. Mr. Speaker, we, we are live on uh, GH1, GBC. Oh, you are live. And uh, we. we <laughs> I would, I would crave your indulgence that um, we take, uh, I've seen some crucial questions that I think must be asked so that we can round up, so that they don't search out just for spending too much of their live air time. And so we'll take the final tranche of questions and then uh, we, will, we will bring proceedings to a close. Very quickly, name, media house, question. No preamble. And Thank you very much. My name is Ernest Kofiedu. I work with the Daily Guy newspaper. Right now, speaker, at the last agenda date, you said that because of the issue of composition and that of the fact that Parliament had the correct number to do business, but they didn't have the correct number to undertake a decision. You are recalling the House tomorrow. Can you tell us whether these issues have been addressed, and whether there has been meeting between yourself and the leadership of the House, such that tomorrow's recall will also not degenerate into that confusion. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, good afternoon. My name is Brian Sassari from Penn TV. Um, in your speech, you just said that um, you expressed concern about the fact that members of the House now um, are resorting to the Supreme Court to deal with conflicts that happen in the House. And you believe that that wouldn't help. Now we're having a conflict now. And I want to know that um, how do we handle this conflict resolution process and who is to initiate it? Because you said you have been doing this for many years. So how can we come together and so this impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Isaac Kando, a freelance journalist. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In your speech, you indicated that the matter before the Supreme Court could have been handled internally through dialogue and compromises. Uh, please, is it too late? We are rounding up. Is that um, ha, have we satisfied you now from this corner? Okay, I think um, we can. Jara. No, Jara. No, Jara. I think we can uh, successfully bring proceedings to a close with Mr. Speaker answering these questions. But I must also indicate that Mr. Speaker, that TV3, 3FM, Joy FM, they are all broadcasting live. In fact, I have received City FM, GH1, TV. And I think, is it TV? They are all live. So um, we, today's been one of the days that we've had the most live coverage. And we're grateful to you before the day comes to say thank you. Just to let you know that we are live on all these channels and on our own channels as well. I'm extremely, extremely grateful to the media for this coverage. That is what is expected of the media. And truly, for these 32 years, Without the media, we wouldn't have gone this far. So, congratulations. We always disagree. But once we have agreed to disagree as part of our life, it's permitted. There's no problem with that. Please, ask what will happen tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, because I don't control that. But you know, what happened? The day of the adjournment, 
I don't see the young man again. Oh, you are the one standing up there. Yes, yes, yes. You know, as I told my friends, on the MPP side, I had three options. After you walked out, and was only left with the NDC members. Accra proceeded with the business. Would they have been approved by, by, by the NDC MPs for government? Even if they did, would they not go and raise an issue about quorum to take decision? So that was not a legally accepted option. I would have decided to adjourn till the next day. By knowing the nature of the disagreement, would it have been solved within one night? Because I've seen that the nature of the disagreement goes beyond the house to the powers outside the house. And so we needed to engage many more people to be able to resolve the disagreement. So you need more time. And since I have estimate the time, I decided that it should be what? Indefinite. After we resolved that, then Parliament could be recalled. If people were mindful that there is some agency for us to resolve it, they would have come together faster for us to talk. Negotiate things, resolve it, and come back. But I tell you, apart from some senior citizens, patriots of the country, who actually got in touch with me, the leadership of the MPP members have not gotten in touch with me. They haven't. My good friend, Osei Chairman Sabonsu, spoke to me because he wasn't even around when this thing happened. And we discussed this thing. I threw more light on it. And he said, oh, he didn't know before granting interviews. He said those things. But now he can also say, I should bring my <laughs> official report. You know? <laughs> so, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know of the resolution of the disagreement. And so I don't know what will happen tomorrow. But I'll be available to preside. You understand? And so that is the situation now. Uh, the last question. Proposal. Proposal. Well, am I now to propose it to you and Ghanaians? Or I should have been making the proposals to the parties so that they can be negotiating and compromising? I think that's the best way to do. And I'm expecting that, like the, in fact, I need to praise some leaders because the first to get in touch with me, I think, was Apostle Nyamiche and the, the boss of the Christ Apostolic Church. They were the first to come to express concern and had a lengthy discussion. You know. Then later, uh, the, a delegation of the Council of State also came to meet me in the office. And when I explained all the situation to them, in fact, many of them were really surprised because what they heard on air and what I told them and said they could cross check from the proceedings or other things, they were really surprised because they didn't know that was what took place. There was so much misinformation and all those, and I don't want to go into those details because they are before the court. <laughs> 